Girl, Ember Wave is back. You guys, you know Julian and I are obsessed with Ember Wave because we are very, very hot people. This is like the bracelet that regulates your temperature. Yeah, I just want to say this. It says Ember Lab's mission is to bring thermal wellness to the world. That is a great <laughs> fancy way to really say they're going to help us stop complaining. Yeah, and that's the thing, you guys. Temperature is so personal. So I married a man who is always cold. I'm always hot. This is a way that we can go to sleep at night. I can put on my Ember Wave bracelet, like set it to the cooling setting and sleep really cool cool and go to sleep. Right. When I first saw this, I was like, oh, it, it looks really cool, but there's no way I'm going to be able to sleep with this bracelet on, uh -huh. right? And be comfortable <laughs> and be cool. But no, it, it looks cool. It makes me feel cool. And it's also not intrusive at all. No, and it really works, you guys. This was developed by scientists. Mm -hmm. It totally makes me cool, but it also works for heat. Steve has also used it to warm himself up on days I want the windows open. Yeah. And just like in case you're having a hard time understanding what it feels like, you know, when you put like an ice cube to your wrist yeah. or if you want to feel warm for some reason you would put your hands around like yeah. a really hot cup of coffee. It's that kind of feeling. So it's subtle. It's awesome. I love it so much. We love it, you guys. The second generation of Ember Wave bracelet has arrived, experienced the same thermal wellness benefits in a brand new wearable and app design. You can pre-order the Wave 2 on the website, or you could still order the original Ember Wave, which would make a great gift for your mom this Mother's Day. Just saying. Yes, and you can save $50 on either product by visiting emberwave.com slash TCO. And that's E-M-B-R wave.com slash TCO. Don't suffer anymore. Get your Ember on. I know. And stop fighting with your person. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> hey, TCO fam. Surprise. So this week, we wanted to do something we've never done before. Give every member of the TCO fam access to one of our Patreon episodes. And so we decided that our take on Making a Murderer Season 2, Episode 1, would be a great example to share of what we're doing over on the Patreon feed. As a reminder, you guys, if you become a member of the Patreon fam, you get instant access to over 50 full bonus episodes, including our episode-by-episode -episode coverage of The Jinx, Serial, The Staircase, and Making a Murderer. You get a new full bonus episode every week, and we're now offering a level where you can also get ad-free versions of our regular episodes. You can check it all out at patreon.com slash truecrimeobsessed. And now enjoy the episode, you guys, and get ready for the one and only Queen Kathleen Zellner. Girl! You guys. Here we are. Here we are. Here we are. TikTok. Zellner clock. clock. Queen KZ is here. Make a murderer. House. Part two, episode one, number 18. You guys, I mean, what a great episode. Yeah. Do you know what number 18 is in reference to? No. Because Kathleen Zellner has released 17 wrongfully convicted men and Stephen Avery just might be number 18. You guys, we get a bunch of footage from Dream Killer. Yeah. We see Ryan Ferguson a lot in this. I know. He's easier on the eyes than I remember. I forgot that he was so handsome. Well, we've been looking at a lot of Stephen Avery. <laughs> I know. You it's, know. He's it's, aging a lot in jail. He, well, it'll do that to you. So yeah. I've heard. You guys, I kind of love how it starts. I do too. It starts with like all of this footage from like November 2015, which is five and a half weeks before the original Making a Murderer comes out. From his 2003 release from prison for a crime he did not commit, all the way through his 2007 conviction for Hallbach's murder, Stephen Avery's notoriety has been followed by the people in Northeast Wisconsin. And now, in a 10-part series being released on Netflix next month, Making a Murderer. Making a Murderer. Making a Murderer. Making a Murderer. Making, 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 making a Murderer. I didn't even heard about this yes. until about a week ago. And it's now been everybody's talking yeah. about it. Right, and a lot of people already don't like it because it's like 10 years later now we have to drudge up this whole case and a lot of people Teresa's family and friends think that it's kind of really tacky and gross to like make money or make entertainment about their friend and loved one's murder which is funny because it, that like it's very localized nobody in the world knew anything about this case until making a murderer happened right so then making a murderer happens <laughs> and now we're seeing just like the f remember what a phenomenon this was absolutely yeah, people around the world millions of views the sea of angry social, social media are extremely outraged Stephen Avery's Lawyers now are rock stars. People love Sex them. Sex them all. Good morning, heartthrobs. <laughs> Celebrities have taken to social media. Celebrities, they've been tweeting. Tweeting like crazy. Everyone is talking about this docuseries. Everyone, number one, is on Stephen Avery's side. 
Yeah. Dean and Jerry are hard Except drops. for like Sean Hannity, who we have to stomach <laughs> for two seconds. And like even the president of the United States is asked to weigh in and pardon them. In a lengthy response, the White House wrote in part, since Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are both state prisoners, the president cannot pardon them. A pardon in this case would need to be issued at the state level by the appropriate authority. He was like, girls, I wish I could. Right. He's like, you know, me and Michelle are binging the shit out of this. Yeah, but the state has to do it, not the president. But then speaking of which, we see the garbage governor, Scott Walker. He's, uh, can we get a ding, please? Yeah, totally. Garbage. And he's basically saying like people watching a TV series calling for a pardon without having little or no knowledge of major pieces of evidence. The governor has not seen Making a Murderer, but calls it one-sided. Documentaries tend to offer a kind of a balanced approach. It's really not a documentary. And then, of course, we just get, I have to just shout them out, how, like, Dean and Jerry were heartthrobs and sex symbols. Right. And we go into that whole, like, everyone was in love with them. It's kind of hilarious, but we do see Ken Kratz for just a second. I'm going to do everything in my power to free Steve Avery, and then I'm coming after you. Viewers made death threats against Kratz and his family. His Yelp page is under an active cleanup alert because of all the negative comments. I hope your daughter gets raped and murdered. Look, I am all for the really bad one-star Yelp reviews on yes. his law firm, which he shouldn't even have <laughs> right. uh, anymore. But to say, like, I hope your daughter gets raped and murdered, that's awful. That's Ken Kratz is garbage. But leave his daughter out of it. Ken Kratz has tried to change his appearance. He's like grown a beard. It looks so disgusting. <laughs> and I think he's trying to speak with a deeper voice. Did you notice? Rather than this, it's more like this. Fuck you, Ken Kratz. <laughs> so the cops are getting all this hate mail. Like, so while even though people say it's one sided, I mean, there are protests about it. Yeah. Manitowoc County, take a stand. Don't in prison, an innocent man. The Netflix documentary really opened up everybody's eyes. Couldn't sleep, couldn't rest. I knew something had to be done. We all live on Navy Road. I don't believe in the corruption in Mantua County. I, I'm 100% behind the police officers. I think if they have nothing to hide, they would give these two guys retrials. DNA evidence proved it, so he's guilty. Simple fact. This could have happened to you. This could have happened to any of your family. I also was saying that we do eventually get the garbage roundtable of like Nancy Grace, Dr. Phil, and Janine Pirro. Oh, God. <laughs> that must have been while well, I was feverishly right. Because, you know, they have like the yeah, montage is so, so fast. Quickly. I was like, oh, Janine Pirro. Remember when we loved her in the Jinx? Look, we agreed with almost everything she said in the Jinx. We did. We loved Janine Pirro. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> So now Ken Kratz says, the most important thing left out of the documentary is the DNA on the hood latch. The DNA that was found on the hood latch was the most persuasive. His sweaty hands reached underneath the hood and, and got onto the hood latch. You can't plant sweat. How do you leave that out of the documentary? This is where, you guys, the phrase is coined sweat DNA. Right. So he's like, you can't plant sweat. And I'm all, Ken Kratz, you're not allowed to say sweat because now I'm picturing you sweating. I know. Did you see Kathleen Zellner's tweet from yesterday? Look, her q and <laughs> I posted like six <laughs> screenshots in the Facebook group about it. I was obsessed. She was dragging Ken Kratz and talking about her dog. I know. <laughs> Bruno. Bruno hates Brady violations. Did you see I that know. tweet? No. Someone was like, oh my God, uh, something about the case. And then also... <laughs> What kind of dog is Bruno? And she's like, Bruno is a cockapoo and he hates Brady violations. I was like, girl, same. It was amazing. Kevin Zelda. She speaks my language, man. I'm telling you. She really, really does. But you guys, sweat DNA is not a thing. It's DNA not- is DNA is DNA. There's no such thing as sweat. Like, your DNA and your sweat is not, as far as I know, different from your DNA and your hair or your tears or whatever. Your saliva. No. Yeah. It's, it's all DNA. It. Yeah. Enough already. So it's nine years after the verdict. You guys were home with the Averys, and this goes on forever. But basically, it's like I was like, Dolores has an age today. No, the dad's lost a little bit of weight, and nobody's wearing any underwear, and nobody's wearing any underwear. Yeah, not a stitch. Yeah, we're just like an afternoon at home with the Avery family. I know, and, and they're kind of just like living their life the best way they can. It's just so sad. Like Dolores says, you know, at some point in this montage of misery, she says, like, I told him he better be home for Christmas, though. How many Christmases we all I didn't even make that last the last couple of years. What for? It's so awful. Yeah. 
But at the same time, on the other hand, she's going through all of the supporter mail and photo albums and vision boards and yeah. all of this. Like, And it's like, you guys, that's great. And she needs that emotional support. But like, that's not going to get him out of prison. No. And then, you know, we see like the hall box and we see like the church where Teresa went. And there's all the blue ribbons are still up. And we get, all, you know, it, we do get a lot of Teresa in this episode, which I, the first time I watched, I remember really liking that a yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. And we get a little bit more about her friends describing the kind of person that she was. That video about like, she loves to laugh. We see it in the in the first season too. It's I, so ominous to me. The thing about that video, and no shade, because like who isn't drunk all the time? But I was like, is Teresa drunk in this video? Like she just seems like she's talking, like she's had a couple glasses of wine and she's just talking to the camera about what she likes. I love taking pictures. I love holding the camera in my hand. I love kids I love babies. I love traveling. I love talking about traveling. It seems like she knew it's, there's a very like knowing tone. She's like, I want Uh people to remember me as someone who, and I'm like, remember you. It is weird. It's an interesting thing to say, but it's like, I don't know, sometimes when you're, and this is what, 2005, so not every, or no, or before that, this was like early 2000s, so not everyone had a camera in their face all the time. Right, right. You know, like not everyone was doing Insta stories, so maybe they she was just having like a really like raw, maybe- stoned or whatever conversation. It's true because we see that this is kind of the only video we get of her throughout and she is acting a little bit like, ah, you yeah. know, it's weird. Um, but- then we get one of her friends. Okay, we meet one of her friends who's basically saying like the memory of Teresa is the most important thing. Are we going to say the, the same thing? We probably are because he says, it doesn't matter at this point to our, our side of it, Teresa's friends, her family. Do we want to see the right person convicted? Yeah, I guess, but it's, it's that secondary compared to anything else. She's she's gone, and once she's gone, there's nothing else you can do about that. Yeah, so, I don't think that's an okay thing to say out loud. So yes, we are going to say the same. Yeah, thing. <laughs> this stopped me in my me facts too because they shouldn't be compared. One hundred percent. She is gone, but you do want some kind of justice or closure. And look, I'm, I can't speak for this. I don't have this experience. Luckily, luckily, totally. So I don't know, but it does seem a little like you don't care if the right person, just like someone, has to suffer. And I think his point is that like the victim has been forgotten here. We're talking about. A documentary series. Sure. And if you're asking me if I care about that, I don't. I care about Teresa. And that is completely valid yeah. because th- this happens a lot, right? Like, especially in Dream Killer, it was all about Ryan Ferguson and that and Charlie or Chuck or whatever. Right. And we kind of like, but a person is still dead and we have to figure out who, what happened. I know. It and happens it, all the time. It's just a, we- it was a weird thing to say. Absolutely. It really, I was like, wait, say what? I rerouted yeah. it four times. And now we're like, we're with Brendan and Barb on the phone and Brendan just like sounds like he's doing fine and jail. He can't keep up with the letters. I got a lot of letters to do. <laughs> well, you got a lot of them now? Yeah, in the past couple of days, I've been getting 20 of them. Ooh. Like, my stack is up to 38 now. Ooh, you better start writing. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do, but every time I try to catch up, I get another fucking 20 of them. <laughs> He's like, my hand hurts. Like, every time I try to write them, there's a whole other batch for me to respond to. It's true. It's true. And then we, of course, get the heartbreaking. Like, Barb is sobbing about how Brennan used to be closer, but now they moved him to a prison 300 miles away, and she can't go and see him as often. It's so fucking it's sad. It's so bad. You never, like, as somebody who has no experience with the prison system, you never think about details like that. Yeah. That's Totally, horrible. how far away they can be, yeah. And they can just move you just to make your life sad and hard. Yeah, or quote, like, oh, just like, for security or maximum security or whatever. But right. it's just like, no, they just want to make everything difficult. You guys, remember Laura Nerider? Yeah, Laura is amazing. Laura is one of Brendan's defense, post-conviction defense attorneys. Right, with Steve the lawyer. Yeah, with Steve the lawyer. So much of post-conviction work is emotional at this point. You know, you start, you come on board a case at the lowest point for a person. They've just been convicted. They're in that hole. It's a black moment for them. This stuff takes years. It can take decades. The fights are so long, and they can get ugly, and they can be painful. She kind of cannot contain herself. I love her. She is always at the edge of her seat. You can yeah. like tell that her legs are like bumping under the table. Yeah. You know why? Because she finally has a gigantic megaphone to talk about this thing that needs to be talked about all the time. It's, it's like wrongful convictions. Yeah. And yeah. she's just like, the more you talk about it, the more eyes are on it, the more important it is. And she, I think, is just totally like relishing the fact that she gets to educate us on this because we are on the edge of our seats watching this. It's true. And she says this thing about how like the thing about the truth is that it's really hard to cover up the truth for a long time. 
especially in a case like this where it's just sitting there, the truth is just sitting there on the interrogation tape. All you have to do is persuade someone to take that close and careful look at it. She's right about that, but it made me think that like, in jail, one day is a long time. Like, 100%. you know, I believe that the truth about this murder will come out someday. Sure. Maybe it'll be after we're all dead. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll be five years from now. Maybe it'll be next week. Maybe it'll be in 10 years. But, like, I agree with what she's saying, but it's still really sad when you think about, like, that could be a long time. Right. Especially because she's like, and the truth is sitting there and no one, no one is looking at it. Right. So now we see lawyer Steve again, Steve Drizzen, and he's explaining to us the way the post-conviction world works. The deeper we get into this system, the more losses that we accrue, the harder it is to win. We lost in the state trial court in front of Judge Fox. We lost in the appellate court. We hoped the Wisconsin Supreme Court would take the case. And the judge that's looking at the case now, and Laura will tell us a little bit more about this. It's a federal judge. Yeah. And Laura will tell us that the thing about federal court is you actually don't have a constitutional right to not be in jail if you're not guilty. She is as horrified as we all are right now. The thing is, it took me a minute to understand what she's saying. Yeah. And what she's saying is, somebody like Brendan can't walk into federal court and simply say, here's evidence that I'm innocent. Here's evidence that I didn't do this crime. You can't even walk in and say, here's who did do this crime. Being wrongfully convicted isn't enough. You can have a video of someone committing the crime you're accused of, and that's not going to fly. What you need to prove is that your constitutional rights were violated during prosecution. So you can have somebody who's saying, no, I did this, no, I did Here's this. Here's video of it. Of Here's this. It doesn't matter. If you had good representation and everything was fair, the judge can leave you legally in jail. Which is... Chilling. I know. It should scare every one of us. Kathleen Zellner's right. Don't walk outside your <laughs> house. And the thing is, when that happens, if a judge rules, yes, the Constitution was violated during your prosecution, you just get a brand new trial. It doesn't get thrown out. Right. You start all over again. Right, because sometimes that, that happens with people who are like legitimately guilty. Right. You know? And Kathleen Zellner says as much later. It's so crazy. And this is what a writ of habeas corpus is. Did yeah. I sound you did. super smart? You did. Okay. You totally did. Yeah, I mean, so basically what Laura is explaining to us is that the case has now been moved to federal federal court and this is the best chance Brendan has. Okay, so Laura and Steve the lawyer are trying to prove this constitutional violation in two ways. It's yes. twofold. I'm going to sound really smart. I know. Because I'm quoting all these amazing women. Did you go to law school? I did. It's called Netflix. <laughs> um, so the first way that they're going to try to prove this is one, his interrogation slash false confession because it violated his Fifth Amendment rights right. because he was coerced into confessing. Right. And number two is Brendan's Sixth Amendment right to counsel was violated thanks to Len Kashitsky. His actions so violated the sacred duties that an attorney owes his client. Essentially, that it was like Brendan Dassey had no lawyer at all. Because that was when the judge was like, yeah, that confession's admissible. So yeah. Ken- Len Kashitsky's like, I don't want to do any work. I'm just going to go with it. If the judge ruled it's admissible, it would be very strong evidence that I'm sure a jury would find quite believable because it's right there on tape, uh, the whole thing. And it's clear that it wasn't uh, the result of any uh, intimidation type of tactics by law enforcement. This is also the interview where he starts a sentence and flubs it. And then he's like, can I take that again? Girl, this is not, you're not on set. This is real life. Can I take that again? Girl. He is such a little pipsqueak. And then Laura tells us that the other thing about this like habeas corpus situation that they're in, there's no deadline for the judge to make a decision. Yeah. So it could happen in five minutes, it could happen, whatever. And then we get the on-screen text that says, the judge has had this written for 20 months. 20 months. Just a reminder, Brendan is now 26 years old Uh when this came out, serving a life sentence, and he'll be eligible for early release in 2048 at the age of 59. And Stephen is 53 years old and serving a life sentence with no early release. But girl, take your time. Right. 20 months. 20 months. The typical hurry up and wait. Yeah. File this thing, file this thing, do all the paperwork. Laura and Steve the lawyer be amazing. Right. And then you just sit and the time just goes by. You know who's not just sitting around? Dean and Jerry are going on a tour, y'all. Yes. We were talking at one point. And we said, you know, wouldn't it be good if we could have some kind of a forum where we could actually let people uh, engage in a real conversation about this? And uh, so the idea of the of a of a speaking tour came up. A conversation on making a murderer is booking theaters across the country. Basically, what they're saying is that, like, hey, we realize that we had now an audience. People yes. wanted to hear what we had to say. We have a lot to say about how like dangerous the system is and how fucked you are if you get caught up in it. And so, so that's what they're doing. They're going on tour and sort of explaining their experience. And Dean 
hates it. Like yeah. he loves it, but he like he's like, I can't believe this is the world we live in where I have to do this shit, but fine, book it. Dean Strang actually made an appearance at the Minnesota State Capitol today. Later tonight, he's going to be speaking to a sold-out audience in Minneapolis. But when we don't have confidence in the workings of the system, I think we have an obligation to try to work towards a system that makes fewer mistakes. Yeah. How do you do that? You talk about it. You were saying once about why Damien and Lori do their tours. Anyone can be a juror. We need to educate the potential jury pool. You guys, everyone is involved and responsible. All of us. Yeah. Because you can be called for jury duty tomorrow. So now we see Sandy. Sandy's now being described as Steven's friend. Yes, I saw that too. I know. That came really, that jumped out of the screen to me. I guess they're not together anymore. Regardless of who she is. Yeah. She's just an advocate for him. And she's awesome. She's his friend. And, and, you know, she was saying that, like... When Stephen found out that the Supreme Court had denied his case, that they wouldn't even look at it, he was totally devastated. I've never seen him so down. He lost his lawyers. He lost everything. This was 2011. He had been there all that time. That's when the law library stuff started, where he was going to get himself out. He said, I had to do it the first time, and I'll do it again. Yeah, bye. Bye. I have to go now. I know. I have to go study. So while he's in prison, pre-Making a Murderer season one, Steven sees Kathleen Zellner on Dateline. Yes, talking about Ryan Ferguson. Right. And Sandy's like, she's the one who's going to get you out. Yeah. And Steven's like, email her. And Sandy's like, on it. (laughs) So the thing about Queen KZ... Is that she, she must get 800 million emails a day. 100%. But she also does this pro bono. Right. Which is very important because Steven doesn't have any money. How does she have any money? I think her law firm, if I'm, I'm totally speculating yeah. here. One, I think she made a shit ton of money back in the day before uh-huh. she decided that she was going to do this. And two, I think she's like Zellner Law. Yeah. And I think other people are taking other cases and she's focusing on the pro bono yeah. wrongful conviction. That's my guess. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense to me. Also, if she needs money, I will throw all of mine at her. I know. <laughs> if, she's, if she's in trouble. So they're writing her constantly. Finally, Queen KZ writes to Sandy. And she's like, look, so sorry I ignored your first 22 emails. I get a lot of them. Yeah, and then this like multi-part documentary series on Netflix came out and this is now the most high-profile case in the world. I'll be glad I'll to take do it. it. Who's got two thumbs and is the best lawyer for Steven? This Me. gal. Yes, <laughs> which is a little, even Super Hot Husband Mike was like, if you're like a Kathleen Zellner skeptic, you could say that maybe she did it just for the attention. And I'm like, maybe. A lot of people did say that. I remember not knowing who she was and hearing that this was happening. Right. And that's fine. But like, go to her Twitter feed. She just got someone out last week. A lot not of, a famous person. A lot of people's opinions changed. People that I that I respect in the biz felt very strongly like she was kind of a joke. And then like watching it happen, they're like, nope, we were wrong. Yeah. She's working on like seven cases at a time. Yeah. Pro bono. So totally. like every once in a while, like maybe nothing's happening in the Stephen Avery case today. Go to her Twitter feed. She got someone out of Cook County to. <laughs> weeks ago <laughs> unbelievable so sandy like jumps in the car drives up to steven and she's like i couldn't wait to get to the prison and i remember sitting down with him and i said i just don't even say anything don't don't even talk to me i just want to say one thing kathleen zellner wants your case i was a half and camper he's the best lawyer to ever see we got her. And it's like, we got Annie. Don't, That's what it don't. feels like. You guys, a little Annie reference, a little don't. Anne Ryan King. We got Annie. Bum, bum, banana. We got KZ. You guys, here she is. Oh Carol Bell in all of her glory, right to camera, sitting, posture for days. I know. A pantsuit, dressed to kill. <laughs> right out of the gate, she's like, look. I told Stephen Avery the same thing I tell everyone. If you hire me and you're guilty, trust me, I'll do a way better job than the prosecutor's. I will find out if you are guilty, and we're going to do testing. We can't control the results. The results will be turned over to both sides. So really think about this. You would have to be an idiot to be hiring me to prove that you're guilty. Almost threatening people to come. Like, come at me, bitch. (laughs) Because if you're guilty, I'll get you another four consecutive life sentences. Try me. Don't waste my goddamn time. Yeah, she's like, she says, really think about this. I know. She's like, the tests don't lie, sweetheart. Science doesn't lie. Right. So we're going to test things and we're going to do all this stuff and both sides are going to get it. Yeah. So do you want me to get it and have it be good for you or do you want it to be bad for you? Because I'll make it bad for you. (laughs) Say it to my face one more time. I'm obsessed with her. So this... Then we get like five minutes of like Kathleen Zellner early in her career. She was representing this, I guess, serial killer named Larry Eiler. We begin tonight with the confessions of a serial killer. Tomorrow, the attorney for murderer Larry Eiler 
will reveal his secrets and his roles in many unsolved murders. Eiler died this weekend in prison from complications of AIDS. His attorney, Kathleen Zellner, has scheduled a news conference to reveal Eiler's written confessions and details of unsolved killings. Yeah, we covered this a little bit in Dream Killer. So basically, he she was defending a murderer. Right. And felt she actually couldn't sleep at night. She hated this. The, because the reason was she knew she could get him off. I was really good at gathering new evidence. And I'd uncovered a constitutional violation that was going to reverse the case. And it was the only murder he'd been convicted of. That was disconcerting to me that I could be, my abilities could be used to potentially free someone who's killed 21 people. Basically, she's like, my skills can be used for the forces of evil. So what she does is she gets this guy to confess to her. To her only. Personally. Yeah. And then she's like, when he was dead, it was kind of a relief because now I get to go to these parents of these young boys that he killed. And she is like choking up in the press conference and she goes, I got to use my powers for good. Give these people closure. And she's like. I really didn't want to do another case like that. And I didn't want to represent anyone that was guilty. You guys like the music changes I know. in it's this? this weird interlude. I was like, put a pin in her. I need to look up this Larry Eiler person. I know. Uh, garbage. I know. Girl, bye. Look, you guys, she has the case for two minutes before she goes out and buys a RAV4. And she says as much. <laughs> She's like, it really didn't take me long. It was like this next scene is Kathleen Zellner pulling into a parking lot in a RAV4. I remember being like, is that a RAV4? It sure is. <laughs> But I love how she's like, it didn't It didn't take me. Are you going to be asking stupid questions the whole time? Because I really don't have time. Yes, of course, I've got a RAV4. I had to buy the same vehicle that Teresa had because so much of the evidence was concerned with the car. I think the blood stains in the car are probably the biggest piece of evidence against Stephen Avery in the whole case. So, right, because Teresa drove a RAV4. That right. was the car that, like, had flakes of Stephen Avery's blood. So, Dean and Jerry, the guys who, like, represented Stephen all the way up until now. Teen heartthrobs. Who we love. Yeah. Are we going to find out they did a bad job? No, I think no one is Kathleen Zellner. I know. You know, they weren't thinking about getting the car because you have to be a certain level of amazingness to be like, <laughs> TikTok, can someone get me a RAV4? <laughs> Hello, I've been on this case for a full five minutes. Where is my RAV4? Yeah, I think Dina and Jerry were so like appalled by how it was going that they were like, well, we have the key planted. We have the confession. Like, I think they were just looking at other things. Totally. So I don't think they did a bad job. I think the, the cards were always stacked against them. But like, no one's Queen KZ. So Kathleen Zellner, basically her whole point in getting this RAV4 is to point out that this blood that they found in the RAV4 had to have been planted. To have your blood in the car, it's huge. And so I wanted to spend a lot of time on it, and I wanted to do a bunch of experiments. Stephen Avery had a cut on his finger, and the prosecution had said that's how he got the blood in the car. And the defense is saying, no, that blood was planted. Well, we see a picture of the cut. We see Stephen's finger. It's like part of evidence, this picture. That cut was from a week ago. Right, exactly. Easily. But even if it were bleeding, Kathleen Zellner conjectures, he still would not have gotten the blood on the car. So she starts to do these experiments, which are not scientific, you guys. (laughs) Right, but she... what I love about her so much is that she's all about the testing. She's all about like, yeah. like science doesn't lie, right? Right. For how scientific it is, it doesn't matter. She's yeah. just like, show me the proof. I love that she goes and she just goes to like the experts at the top of their field. Right. There's no ego involved. She doesn't she doesn't want to be the smartest person in the room. Exactly. She wants to talk to these like blood experts. It's so funny. These people vibrate on such a high level yeah. that like we, we see them in his conference room or her one of the conference rooms. Right. And she's talking about what he, she knows and he He's talking about what he knows. And you see this like a hot assistant to Kathleen Zellner in the background, like scribbling <laughs> notes as fast as he can. I think his name is Nick. Yeah. Um, but hi, she, Nick. Hi, Nick. Call us, hey, girl. girl. But even she's like, as she's talking, she can like see the chessboard three moves ahead. And at one point she's like, oh, yes, exactly. Right. Yes, that's exactly right. And I'm like, what, what is? What did I miss? <laughs> Please explain it. Because what they're saying is that if, if that cut was an active form of bleeding, blood would be everywhere. It'd be on the gear shift. It'd be on the door. And there's right. no blood on the gear shift or the door. Right. The blood is in little, very specific seeming spots. 
right. and we learn more about this because now we're in a parking lot <laughs> and she's going to recreate the scene. She, you guys. She needs someone with hands, most like Stevens, the attention to detail. I know. Nick, the, <laughs> Nick, the assistant, wins the pot. Yeah. His hands are extremely similar to Stevens. So we've got the cut right here. Yeah, same thickness, same. Right. Yeah, not like your hands. Your hands don't match his at all. So what I want to do Sorry, is <laughs> drip. Just have some blood right there. All right. Hey, where was the cut on the inside? It's right here. On the first joint, it's right there. Okay, let's just do this. You guys, this is real blood. We find out that the blood that she's using in this experiment, she got from a lab. This is real blood. Yeah. It's disgusting. Yeah. So they've all got like latex gloves on. Kathleen Zeller's taking like an eyedropper and just like smearing blood on this kid's like gloved hands. Right. What they're trying to do is there's a smear of blood in Teresa Hallback's RAV4 that's right where you put the key into the ignition and turn the key. It's in a place where when you turn the key in the ignition, it seems like if your finger were bleeding, you'd get blood on a little plate there. Right. They do this 1,700 times. Right. And not once. It's three inches away. Queen KZ is like, you can do this a thousand times, I promise you. <laughs> your bl- your finger will never, ever touch it. Right. So they also do a thing where they're like opening the door and to see if there'd be blood on the door. Of course, there's blood on the door handle. She'll even add more blood. Like she'll give the benefit of the doubt. She's yeah. like, okay, so let me just, uh, let me just douse your whole hand in blood and see what happens. Like she's it's like Carrie like, the Musical in there. Right, totally. Or American Psycho or whatever. <laughs> yeah. She's just trying to see like how much blood does there need to be for your hand to graze this or blood to get on that. Like right. she really is trying, like maybe she's wrong. Right, she's right. She's trying to figure it out. Exactly. Scientific or not. When she does this first blood experiment, and we're back in her office, and she's like, no, bitch, this blood did not come from this cut. What does that tell me? Kate Kratz was lying. Once I uncover one lie like that, I know there's a whole bunch more lying going on. Because no legitimate, honest prosecution would ever resort to that. So when Kratz says in the closing, you know, it doesn't matter if the key was planted. We've got so much else. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, it matters, you know, because the whole case can collapse on one piece of evidence. But once I saw that, I thought, you know, all of this blood testimony is just a complete lie. So now there are also these, like, random blood dots on the back of the RAV4. Yeah, so, and we get the testimony of the original, from the original trial, and it's basically this, quote, blood expert telling us that, like, This is the rear door of the RAV4. This is the interior panel of that door. And do you observe any bloodstain patterns on the interior panel of the rear cargo door area? Yes, I did. Please describe those for the jurors. You can see here, these are impact stains. They're circular or near circular, and then some of these stains have a flow pattern. Were you able to determine how those would be deposited, the ones that you observed, the impact stains with the flow pattern? These stains, or these, this blood was, was appeared to have been flung off or released from a bloody object. And it's like smear patterns from her hair being up against the wall. So clearly her body was put inside there. Right. Now the blood spatter. Yeah. I watched Dexter. Um, <laughs> the blood spatter on the car is as if you had like a bucket of water and put your hand in it and then just went like. Right. And where it is on the RAV4, it's like, imagine like the back of a SUV that opens outwards. Yes. Yes. So like that's what this is. So we're looking at the rear cargo door of Teresa Halbach's vehicle. Um. How would you describe this blood stain pattern? It would fall into the uh, classification of a uh, cast-off pattern, which means, by definition, that uh, wet blood has been flung from an object. Is there any way that you can determine from the pattern on the vehicle where they were positioned when they made that movement that caused the pattern. It's like specks of blood. Yeah, it, yeah, it's like you did that move with your hand that we're doing, not a visual right. medium. It's like but... a Jackson Pollock sort of like specks of blood. Exactly. But not even a lot. Not a lot at all. So you're kind of like how, if her hair was covered in blood, right? why isn't why aren't there streaks of blood? Because remember, she was stabbed brutally, correct? Yes, exactly. Or supposedly, air quotes. I have to say, we're in we're in the office, we're back in the conference room with a blood spatter expert, and Kathleen's like brain is moving a mile a minute, and she yeah. asks for a pen, and somebody hands it to her, and it's like she doesn't know how to use it. She's like, oh God, okay. Like she can't like write it down fast enough. Or like, it's like she's not used to taking her own notes. It's like that time Karen Walker was handed a Coke can and yeah. she tries to crack it like an egg. Honey, what's this? What's happening? What's going on here? I just love how she talks to people because she's like, okay, so on your example there, just so I understand this, if the body were flung into the back of the trunk, show me which stain I would expect to see if the blood came directly off the body, what would I be seeing on the rear cargo door? 
You would be seeing stains that are more elongated with the tail of the stain pointing in that direction of travel. Okay, so if I were looking here, I mean, I'm seeing stains with a tail on them, but you're saying... Those are, no, those are float patterns. She just is That's desperate yeah. for knowledge. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, look, we are back in the parking lot. Why they're doing this in a parking lot and you not, guys, like, outside, I, I, I will never know. I wanted to reenact it. I wanted to understand it. We've got a mannequin that's the same height as Teresa Halbach, same weight. We put weights on her, 135 pounds, and we've got human hair the same length as Teresa Halbach's hair. So the state claimed that Teresa Halbach was shot twice in the head, so we have blood on the hair in that area in the occipital and parietal, so the side and the back. This is a perfect snapshot of what people think about Kathleen Zellner because the whole scene looks ridiculous. Right, which is like, it looks ridiculous, but she's getting the cut, the texture is real, it's real hair, it's real blood. That's what I'm saying. People think she's ridiculous, but then when you like zoom in a little closer, you're like, oh no, no, this is genius. Of course. How else is she going to recreate it? Exactly. So she gets your boyfriend, Nick. You guys, Nick is wearing his fancy work clothes (laughs) and he's like trying so hard to not get real blood on them. He has the job of. Their words, not mine. <laughs> flinging this mannequin into the back of the RV. Fling. They they say the word fling like 18 times. No, no, no. They got to fling her sooner. Just <laughs> fling her. Now fling it a little harder, Nick. Come on. Just fling her like he's talking about. Well, I think they have to fling her a little sooner. One, two. All of the various ways you could fling this body in, they try. They, like, fold her up, toss her in. And the thing is, this is why I think, like, family and friends of Teresa would be like, this is ridiculous. Right. But they have to be cold about it because she's looking at facts right now. Yeah. And she's trying to, like, she's, like, solving a puzzle and a mystery. Like, it's not about emotion to her in this moment. Right, right. What she's finding is that she's right. When they fling this dummy in there, the blood is not getting on the door the way that the state said that it would have. Right. And we also learn that there's no way a body that heavy could even like have the velocity to make the blood fly off in a certain way. Exactly. So now they're adding weights. They're taking weights off. They're just trying to find out like, okay, so if this wasn't thrown in, what was the thing that was thrown in exactly. or something? Just the scene of this like pretty little white boy, yeah. quote, flinging this dummy covered flinging. in real blood into yeah. the back of a rat for is so absurd. And Kathleen Zellner's like, yep, good job. Yeah. Good and I just think of Devil Wears Prada like there are a million girls who would kill for this job. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> now she goes, she's like, look, she kind of levels with us for a minute. She's like, here's the thing. I have to do two things simultaneously. Um, I have to first take apart the state's entire case. But at the same time, I want to figure out exactly what happened. I'm I'm actually driven more by the desire to know what happened because once I figure out what happened, then the state's case collapses. And to her, they're one and the same because if she finds out what happened, then she can free Stephen Avery. Right, exactly. But she's like, it just so happens that I'm just that good. But like, that's what courts want. So we're we're back in the conference room and they're like laying out all these various instruments Mm. That can cast off blood that might provide the sort of pattern that we see on that RAV4 door, right? Right. Yeah, all of a sudden at one point, Kathleen Zellner's holding a gun. I'm like, oh my God, Kathleen Zellner. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. She's got a gun in the conference room. (laughs) (laughs) Somebody get her her coffee. Get Nick. Yeah. And even the blood spatter experts were like, girl, no, put the gun down. Yeah, it, was, it, it wasn't, wasn't a gun. gun. It wasn't a knife. And then they've got these three hammers. Mm. And he's like, it was it was something like one of these. So we cut back to the parking garage. Nick is on his hands and knees, desperately trying not to get his clothes dirty. But he's doing this thing. Oh, God, guys, this is a little bit brutal. Yeah, it's, it's rough. It's so rough. So he, what he is doing is he's miming taking this hammer. And again, this is rough. So mm-hmm. if you want to turn this off now, go go ahead. Yeah. But like sort of like bashing Teresa's head with this hammer. So it's like hitting it, pulling it back, yeah. hitting it, pulling it back. And as he pulls this hammer covered in blood back, it's casting off the blood. You guys, it is landing on that door in the exact yeah. pattern that we know the blood really was. Right. When I saw what they were doing, yeah. I almost stood up and I could not believe it's it. It's a very gaspable moment. Because I kind of think this blood spatter stuff is kind of nonsense. Oh, I don't. I just think it's kind of like, yeah, can we ever really know? True, yeah, yeah. But then it's like, what the state said happened was they flung Teresa in the car, and that's from her hair. So they did that experiment, it didn't work. And they right. tried it every which way. Yeah. This is Kathleen figuring out what happened. Yeah. 
I mean, they are not trying to cast off the blood. They're just making the motion of hitting somebody, pulling your hand back to hit him again. Hitting somebody, pulling your hand back to hit it again. And as you pull the hand back, the blood cast off is creating the exact pattern we see. It is chilling it is. to watch. It is. And I think because, like what you were saying, like, you guys, this is hard to hear, so, like, fast forward for a second. I think that's why they have to separate themselves because this mannequin has to be this mannequin right now. Right, yeah. So instead of like, hey, Nick, can you bash Teresa? Like, no, she right. would never say that yeah, because that yeah. is horrible. Right. They sort of get this this theory that... The swing has got to be horizontal here because if the um, person or the object wet with blood was higher than the actual bottom portion of that hatchback, the blood would have had a downward trajectory. Because ground six level. inches is not going to make a big difference in the shape of the stains. You know what I'm saying? Right, you, right. It's not an acute enough angle. So yeah. somewhere between, you know, kneeling and or further down. And was being bashed in the head with a hammer. Yeah. And Kathleen's like, look, this is day one of testing. I don't know much right now, okay? But I know one thing. Right. It did not occur the way Mr. Kratz told the jury it occurred. It's demonstrably false what he told them. And I intend to do that on each piece of evidence that he presented to the jury. Because this case, more than anything, more than a case of ineffective assistance of counsel, is a case of gross, extreme, egregious <laughs> prosecutorial misconduct. And she just, like, kind of can't believe it. But she's not as riled up about it as we are. She's very calm. Because she and, knows that the, she was going to find some shit like this. Right. And she goes, like, it's going to be a real pleasure to, I don't know, unmask Mr. Kratz. <laughs> Oh, credits. My God. Can you stand it? I know. And it's going to be a real pleasure. She is so calm. She yeah. is so, she so knows that she's going to get, that she's going to win this. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just unreal. You guys, Kate, TikTok's down there o'clock. She's I know. Here. And I think, you know what? It wins. She wins either way. Cause she's like, okay, closure. Now we really do know it was Stephen Avery. Yeah. Or it's not. And, and bonus PS. I found out who did it. Yeah, she exactly. wins either way. Exactly. We get closure and justice either way. Yep. 100%. Thanks. Well said, Jillian Pezzavalli. Thanks. I really just want her to like me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, uh, thank you so much for the iTunes reviews. I'm going to say it again. Please jump on iTunes if you, while you're thinking about it right yeah. now. Give us a review. Tell people what you like about our podcast. Yeah, it really means a lot to us. So thank you very, very much. Come see us live in June. Yes. Uh, the Pride Show is just going to be off the hook. <laughs> okay. Well, it's going to be, it's gonna be, off, it's gonna be off the hook. Off the hizzy. Off the chain? What would your rule say? Your rule? But what I mean, what I mean, what I mean. <laughs> it really People hurts my love. it hurts my throat, you guys. The things I do for love. It's true. We love you guys. Bye. All right, bye. Fam, we hope you enjoyed the episode. To join the Patreon fam and get instant access to over 50 full bonus episodes of TCO, including our episode-by-episode episode coverage of The Jinx, Serial, The Staircase, and Making a Murderer, head on over to patreon.com slash true crime obsessed. Okay, bye.